Good morning and um, happy welcome, warm welcome on behalf of uh, EQS Group and uh, EY um, to our uh, webinar today with the title Understanding the German Whistleblowing Act, Legal Regulations and Practical Solutions for Your Company. So um, I'm really pleased uh, to welcome all of you and um, to host uh, this uh, session for the next hour together with my uh, dear colleague uh, Antje Meyer from uh, EY. She will for sure introduce herself um, when she um, provides uh, her presentation. So um, I think it's, uh, it's really um, uh, an interesting uh, point in time. And um, we uh, were happy to see so many people registering um, for this webinar, but um, as uh, most of you, or maybe even all of you should know, um, we finally made it uh, also in Germany. Yeah? So <laughs> we gave birth to the uh, Hinweisgeber Schutzgesetz, um, as we uh, call it over here, so the German um, Whistleblower Protection Act. And um, it's, uh, uh, so the uh, legislation process is really finalized and completed and uh, the law will be in force um, by the 2nd of July now, finally. And uh, now there is uh, nothing really left open, right? So there is no guessing when it might come into force or guessing what might be the content of the law. It's all clear, it's written down, it's published, and um, we will definitely take uh, the opportunity today to take you uh, through this. Uh, um, Antje will mainly focus on this and uh, give you an, uh, an overview where we are, what's in the law, and what's important for you. And um, before um, we uh, enter into this, uh, maybe just uh, quickly some, uh, some housekeeping um, um, so you are able to um, ask questions. So we've uh, muted all microphones and um, we've made good experience uh, with this format actually. So uh, microphones are muted, but there is the question mark um, symbol um, <clears throat> in this uh, speak speaking bubble uh, where you can ask questions and we will see the questions um, and uh, we will answer some of them uh, during the webinar and uh, collect the others for the Q&A session uh, that we are planning at the end of today's webinar. So we will make sure that we reserve enough time to really um, look at your concrete questions and answer as many of them. And before anyone um, would probably ask the question, what about the slides or a recording of the webinar? Can I get it? Yes, everybody who is um, um, <clears throat> who's participating today will receive a follow-up email um, after the webinar, and this includes uh, links to both the replay as well as the presentations. So you do not need to do screenshots, you do not need to withdraw uh, the slides on a piece of paper or whatever, uh, we are happy to provide them. And <clears throat> um, yeah, with, um, with this, let's um, actually uh, enter um, uh, into uh, today's session. Um, we would very much like to start this with um, two short poll questions um, that will um, allow us to get um, an even better understanding on who's participating. So who is in the audience? Uh, who are you and how far are you as well with uh, things like implementing um, 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 an internal uh, whistleblowing channel. So let's start with the first one, and um, I would be happy if you just <clears throat> let us know how large your organization is. Uh, so a rather small one, up to uh, 49 employees, uh, 50 to 250, um, or larger than 250. So it's uh, open now, and uh, please submit your answers. Ah, okay. I can see it coming in. We'll leave it open for a few sessions and then uh, share the results with you so that also all of you get an uh, idea um, who's in this webinar. And uh, for Antje and myself, it allows us to um, maybe put some focus uh, more on certain aspects and uh, consider um, who you are. All right. So... Just count down, three, two, one, zero, and then click on and see what the results are. So, ah, okay, so uh, majority, clear majority, three quarters um, of the respondents, um, let's say, uh, so-called large enterprises, 
um, larger than 250 employees, very helpful, but still 15% in this, um, let's say, medium-sized uh, slice um, and uh, segment uh, that also plays um, um, a certain role around the whistleblowing uh, legislations. Um, thank you very much for this. Uh, second question, and it's only uh, these two. Um, second question is um, on how far you are in the process. So have you already implemented an internal whistleblowing channel? Um, yes, that's uh, the first option. Um, uh, yes, and it fulfills the requirements of the directive and the national legislation. So I am more or less done and just interested to see uh, what these guys are talking about here today. Or you would say yes, but not final, uh, still some work to do. Um, and some might even say, and we've seen this in another webinar yesterday, where all participants said, oh, we've uh, actually not done anything yet. Uh, we just start to look around. We heard there's a law. Um, so interested to see how this is here. And uh, I'll give it a few more moments as well. OK, let's uh, keep it open for another five seconds, maybe. So final roles. And then we can also take. Look at this. All right, so I'm closing this down. Let's uh, see what we have. Whoa, interesting, interesting. So um, summing up, this would actually say that uh, more than um, half of the participants are large enterprises or large uh, organizations and uh, have already done their job. So you're more or less done, um, but uh, hopefully still uh, some interesting um, content today. Um, but um, on the other hand, uh, more than 40%, um, <clears throat> more than 40% um, have not yet fulfilled all the requirements um, or have not really started, which is uh, with uh, 16 or nearly 17% uh, still roughly a fifth of all of you. Um, okay, so I think uh, there's going to be interesting content in this uh, webinar for all of you. And um, just a quick look um, at the agenda, and then uh, I will hand over to Antje. So what are we going to do? Antje will um, uh, introduce us into um, the German Whistleblowing Act. So what is it? Um, what does it contain? And what does it uh, actually mean for you? And then give some practical insights, um, how you should deal with it, what you need to uh, consider, um, and so on. Um, I myself will uh, cover the third point um, and uh, take a close look on uh, the a closer look on the implementation of um, whistleblowing systems. We keep this uh, rather short and really focus on the first uh, um, two uh, topics mainly. And then, as I said, and this is um, where we've uh, made good experience with, uh, we'll um, reserve enough time for the Q and A in the end because this is obviously always questions from the practice, from you, out of the companies and other organizations, and as much as we can answer, we are happy to do. So by this, uh, over to you, Antje. Very interested to see and to hear about um, yeah, the Hinweisgeberschutzgesetz. Uh, thank you, Jens, and also from my side, a very warm welcome. I'm very happy uh, that I can speak today to you about the German Whistleblowing Act or Hinweisgeberschutzgesetz, like it's called in German. Um, yeah, so my uh, so I'm working as a director at the Ernst Young Forensics and Integrity Services team, and in that role, I am yeah, advising clients on how to design, implement, but also assess their compliance management uh, programs, whistleblowing frameworks, and uh, the fraud response. I'm doing this now since more than 11 years. And um, yeah, besides that, I'm also um, active in the ACFE German chapter as a board member, prepare CV candidates for the exam, and I'm part of the lecturer team at the uh, Compliance Officer Certification for the Management Circle AG. But now enough about me, maybe if you can move to the first slide that we have. Yeah, let's quickly, very quickly go back to the origin of, of that law. Um, the starting point, of course, was the EU whistleblowing directive, which um, entered into force in 2019, uh, end of 2019. Why was this done? Because the EU um, realized that if they want to yeah, actually um, intensif intensify their uh, fight against corruption, um, whistleblowers are a very important source 
for providing tips uh, to uncover fraud and bribery and all of that uh, stuff. Um, but what they also saw is that uh, within the European Union countries, there's very fragmented and little um, protection also when it comes to, to whistleblowers. And also when we look into procedural requirements and all of that. So they wanted to harmonize that. Um, they did this with the EU directive, which basically sets out minimum standards in that connection, as you can see on the slide. And um, just very quickly, of course, uh, the, the main and core element is that whistleblowers need to be protected against retaliation, that uh, reporting channels, confidential reporting channels have to be implemented, um, and that, of course, they, are, they have to follow up on them. Um, you need to communicate with the whistleblower, give them uh, feedback um, um, that they received the, the report, but also feedback on what follow-up measures have been taken and where this actually stands now within certain time frames. Um, and of course, um, the, the, uh, yeah, the persons in scope, the employees need to be informed about what their options are actually when it comes to reporting um, of, of misconduct. Um, so when we look into now um, to the status in the European Union, if you move to the next slide, um, interestingly, um, as of today, we still have three countries that have not implemented anything. However, thanks God, Germany is not on that list anymore. Um, but to be honest, most of those countries have missed the deadline uh, for implementing or transposing the EU Directive International uh, Law, which was December 2021, um, and Germany was part of it. Infringement procedures have, have been start, were started against those countries. Um, but yeah, luckily now we, we have a law. Um, that, as Jens said, will um, enter into force on 2nd of July, so you have roughly a month now um, to make sure that you comply with those requirements that are um, uh, set out there. And um, one important point, of course, here is as well, that's why I wanted to show it to you. So the EU directive um, sets out minimum requirements. Um, European countries can go beyond that when it comes to protection. And um, what we have seen so far is um, from, from the laws that have been enacted in the other countries that the scope um, especially and also, for example, if anonymous reporting is required or not allowed, um, but also certain, um, uh, certain reporting um, um, obligations um, are quite different. So if you have operations, not only in Germany, but uh, in other European countries, of course, you need to make sure that you also comply with those, uh, those requirements that are set out there. That's, I think, an important point because, of course, the German Whistleblowing Protection Act only applies uh, to Germany. Uh, and not not to other countries. Um, when we look now into the German Whistleblowing Protection Act, if you move to the next slide, yeah, you see, of course, um, the um, uh, there's uh, no surprise in the or, uh, organizations in scope, of course, yeah. So, um, of course, it applies to. Um, uh, public and private uh, uh, companies from the public and private sector with uh, minimum 50 employees um, um, and uh, yeah above that um, the bigger companies the ones with 250 employees or more are actually obliged to comply with that starting from 2nd of July and um, the smaller ones 50 to 249 have a little bit more time but not that much uh, to uh, 17th of December uh, this year. Um, so when we look into the personal scope, um, there has been um, a little or slight changes in the last draft. I mean, we have seen a lot of drafts going around. One was rejected in Parliament. The other one was not passing the, the Federal Council in Germany. Uh, and now this version that is uh, comes into force is saying that um, in terms of personal scope, um, persons that are working in the public and private sector, um, which acquired information in a work-related context, so it has to be their employer or direct um, bodies that they work 
that they work with. So the information needs to be about that. Um, when we look into the material scope, and this was quite, quite a thing where there was a lot of heated discussions around that. Um, so the EU directive, of course, um, puts in the material scope uh, potential violations against EU law, of course, right? Which is quite a long list. And for non-lawyers, maybe nothing that is so easily understandable. Um, but uh, of course, this is not enough in terms of scope. And um, that's why in, in Germany, the scope was extended to also suspected criminal offenses and administrative offenses, um, which protect life, limb, or health, or the rights of employees and their representative bodies. Um, so that, of course, it makes it's not very practical if, if you only have EU law, then I think the purpose of the um, of the law would not be would not be fulfilled so that's the extension about that um, so how are whistleblowers protected of course only whistleblowers who report in good faith are protected I think that's clear that's also not a surprise but of course they should be uh, protected um, of any form of retaliation also the attempt to retaliate uh, falls under that but also threats yeah and retaliation has various phases yeah it's not only a termination or dismissal of something it can also be mobbing yeah or uh, not giving the employee access to certain training. So the list is quite long and organizations need to be aware that a lot of things could look like retaliation if um, uh, done against somebody who made, uh, made a report recently. And of course, the um, um, organizations are prohibited to uh, hinder whistleblowers from reporting. I think that's clear that this is something that has to be in there as well um, and uh, one other main main uh, provision is of course that the identity especially of the whistleblower but also um, persons individuals that are mentioned in the report um, should be kept confidential at all times um, and should not not uh, be shared with anyone who shouldn't have access to that um, those protection rights, of course, um, you cannot waive them contractually. So um, even if it's put in a contract uh, um, uh, agreement, you cannot, uh, it's, it's not valid. Um, and the question whether somebody <clears throat> a whistleblower w was retaliated um, is basically um, there's a reverse burden of proof, which means that if the whistleblower claims to have been retaliated, it's the organization that has to prove that it was not the case. Um, here was also the, um, um, the wording also changed. So now um, uh, it's, it's, it says basically that the whistleblower has to claim that. And when he claims that, there's a gross burden of proof. Right. <clears throat> and when we look into um, to the question, if you go to the next slide, um, how internal reporting channels should look like. Um, so um, at least you need to provide the possibility or the option to report in writing orally or if the individual wants it to meet in person. I think that's clear. Um, what has been changed now, um, so there was a huge debate also on the question whether anonymous reporting channels should be provided and there should be an obligation. At the beginning, the first draft of the law was not in there, then it was put in there. And then after, again, very heated discussions around that topic, um, it was taken out. So there is no obligation to um, enable anonymous, anonymous reporting. However, if you receive an anonymous report, then you need to follow up. And now the question is, okay, what options do I have when it comes to anonymous reporting? Of course, there's a tool where you have a post box and can chat with, a, with an anonymous whistleblower. And there's other options as well. But the thing is, if you, for example, yeah, let's say, say, okay, we just provide an email address, right? Then you can receive anonymous reports, but I think it's very difficult to get back to the whistleblower and you know, ask for clarification questions, um, which of course we see in practice that 
when somebody reports a concern at the beginning, it might not be, you know, the way you need to to have the facts to actually understand the case and assess whether um, whether this has to be followed up or not. So, um, yeah, it even though it's not required to have anonymous reporting, it makes a lot of sense to offer that. Um, in terms of design, you're quite free how you can do it. Again, a set could be a post box, email address, um, could be also an ombudsperson um, or digital system or hotline. I mean, as far as um, I know from, from my clients in Germany, they usually prefer a web intake, an email, um, uh, and an email as well. Um, hotlines, I think, is more broadly used in, in the US, for example. However, you can also offer that. And what is also allowed under the law is that you basically um, outsource the operations of the um, reporting channel. So, of course, the ultimate responsibility for the follow-up measures um, that the case gets remediated, et cetera, stays with the organization, but you can get help from, from external third parties if you say like, okay, I don't want to deal, uh, deal with that now, I don't have the resources, the capacity to do that, you can uh, get help from outside as well. And again, um, as said, the core requirements, of course, whistleblowers need to be protected. Um, you need to also, and that's, I think, something um, that um, sometimes gets overlooked is you need to set up a robust process. Yeah, um, where the steps are uh, clear and written down, where you make sure that you also document those cases according to the um, uh, obligations in the law when it comes to confidentiality, but also when it comes to retention periods. Um, the retention period here is three years, but can be in exceptional cases. Uh, cases can be also kept longer. Um, so you need to make sure that you address all of that as well and that you also, as an internal uh, reporting um, channel, provide information how, how those, um, those employees can also report externally. That is also important and where, where they can turn to when, when they don't trust the internal system or don't feel comfortable to, to report um, internally. Um, of course, you need to follow up on every report that comes in. You need to make an initial assessment and also um, yeah, decide which follow-up measures you have to take, uh, whether the case is unsubstantiated, um, it's not a reportable concern under, under the, the law, uh, and um, for example, um, on, and you can close it, or whether you need to uh, yeah, start an investigation, you can also um, give the case to a competent body or uh, to the prosecutors even, if you want to do that. Right. Um, <clears throat> when we look now into, if you go to the next slide, um, into um, reporting options according to the Hinweisgeber Schutzgesetz, so I just mentioned it, um, there is also the option to uh, report externally. Uh, whistleblowers have the right to choose. They don't need to uh, use the internal reporting channel first. Um, they can also turn to the external ones. Um, however, um, and that's also written in the law, is um, internal reporting should be preferred if the whistleblower feels comfortable that um, he won't face any retaliation if he does that and the internal reporting office is able to efficiently follow up on the matter. Um, in terms of external reporting uh, yeah, channels and bodies, the main one is in the Ministry of Justice, but of course there are other ones that are already implemented, like the one at the Federal Supervisory Authority, the BaFin or the Cartel Office. Um, they, of course, stay open, and also each federal state can establish uh, its own reporting channels. Again, here it's the same like for internal reporting channels. The person who actually um, um, yeah, assesses the report and follows up on them, they need to be independent uh, and, of course, free from conflicts of interests, of course. And 
um, have the right skills and knowledge um, as well uh, to be able to deal with those reports, identify red flags, um, how to communicate with whistleblowers, etc. Interestingly, uh, for the internal reporting uh, channels, um, the law states that um, uh, that they need to have the right skill set to do that job. For the external ones, the uh, um, uh, it's written that they need to receive regular training on those cases. So in any way, um, you need to make sure that um, that actually you have the right person with the right skill set, uh, skill sets and training to to work on those cases, receive the reports, etc. Yeah, and under certain circumstances, for example, if um, uh, if the, um, the um, whistleblower um, doesn't receive any feedback from the external reporting office, or he fears for, yeah, shortly fears for his life, let's say, um, he can also publicly disclose um, the information. That's, of course, something, at least from, a, from an organizational perspective, um, that you don't want to have, of course. So you need to make sure that you have uh, reporting channels implemented, that they, uh, yeah, the employees trust you on that process, and um, that they actually uh, yeah, inform you and report your cases that, um, yeah, that fall under that law. Um, what stayed the same <clears throat> is the question, and that's a big question in the European Union, whether a centralized reporting channel is sufficient enough or not. Um, Germany goes goes this way, saying that okay, for German companies, they can implement a centralized uh, reporting office with centralized um, reporting channels. Of course, you need to make sure that for these subsidiaries, if there's different languages, that it's um, that those languages are available and that it's easy for them to report. Uh, important here is that, of course, um, you should make it as uh, yeah, as simple as possible for them, but it's and generally it's allowed. Um, the European Commission has a different view on that. So let's see what the developments in the future in that connection will be. And again, please keep in mind this also only applies for Germany. So if you have operations in other countries, you really need to make sure that you follow um, the local uh, local laws um, and uh, requirements on that topic. Um, not all of the countries have allowed that. Some have, others have uh, don't say anything in their laws about it. And then again, some say uh, that it's not allowed. So you need to make sure that you comply then with those uh, yeah, obligations in those countries as well. But for Germany, as for now, centralized uh, reporting is allowed. Right, um, if we go to the next slide, Right, so um, of course, um, there's also sanctions and damages defined uh, in the law. Um, so when we look into sanctions, um, <clears throat> of course, if you don't have a reporting channel implemented, then there has to be a fine, right? It's not that high, uh, it's 20,000 euros. However, what you need to think of, if you say like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe wait, it's just 20,000 euros, who cares? If you uh, don't have internal reporting channels, then what can your whistleblowers do? They will turn to external reporting channels. And then, of course, you lose the, um, the options that you have to react to the case and manage the case. So your options then are quite limited. So in any case, it makes sense to implement internal reporting ch channels as fast as possible and to comply with that law. Um, also, if a whistleblower makes knowingly false disclosures, yeah, he knows the information is not right that he's disclosing, then this could be a fine. Um, and <clears throat> when um, um, the whistleblower gets retaliated, um, the fines can be up to 50,000 euro or even could, uh, could be 10 times higher um, if, for example, the management is doing that, yeah, the board of directors, the management, or, for example, if if they don't react to, to a, a report, for example. Um, 
When it comes to the reprisals part, so the fines for that, um, I think it's important to mention here as well that um, the uh, fines were, are directed to actually the, the person who caused that uh, reprisal. Yeah, so this is the the uh, the um, the one that is addressed by that provision. Right, and of course, what you also need to take care of because um, uh, fines applying there is um, when you um, breach the uh, duty to keep the identity confidential. That's also something that uh, where fines apply. Um, on the other hand, you also have uh, a compensation for damages. Um, so if the um, if the uh, whistleblower gets um, um, retaliated, then he can claim for damages. Um, but on the other hand, also if a whistleblower reports intentionally or grossly negligent incorrect information, then also he needs to uh, compensate for damages um, in that case. All right. Um, and now <clears throat> let's look into... Um, and that's something I wanted to share with you as well in that call, by, because I think uh, it is important. Let's look into how um, um, how good looks like. Yeah, what what helps you um, to to be compliant with with the directive, but also have a robust and um, really efficient uh, yeah, whistleblowing framework in place. Um, of course, um, policies, procedures roles and responsibilities, et cetera, is something you need to think of. Um, uh, the framework is really, really important that you set the right uh, framework to, to, to work in that area. Um, those policies need to be as clear as possible, of course, uh, when it comes to whistleblowing policy, but also when it comes to the um, yeah, procedures that um, the a team that is responsible for the reporting channels um, should follow um, also what they should document, uh, what the steps are, what the timelines are, et cetera, um, and how to actually triage and uh, uh, investigate, investigate those cases. It's really important that also in that connection you have minimum standards defined. Um, and um, what is also always something that <clears throat> we see um, is um, uh, the question whether you have the right resources and if you have enough resources to deal with incoming reports and also to, to follow up on them. Um, here again, and that's also something required by the law, is they need to have the right knowledge, get training, uh, and um, yeah, um, uh, make sure that they're always up to date uh, with, with what they need to know to process those reports. Um, and training and communication, especially for the bigger group, the ones that should report, is essential. Um, if nobody knows where to turn to and what the procedures are, um, then of course you might not have a lot of reports, but um, you might also miss out the chance to uh, actually see what's going on in your organization and identify, let's say, the, the bad apples um, early enough to, to yeah, actually mitigate uh, damages and uh, uh, financial losses, etc. So uh, important part for that too. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the question of uh, report management, data flow and reporting, I think um, uh, what is really important here, especially also when we look into uh, the topic of dead deadline set out in the EU directive, um, that you are able to collect the right information, the information that helps you solve the case, um, uh, but also helps you then to um, define the right remediation measures and maybe makes you or enables you to see the bigger picture. Yeah? For example, if there is, I don't know, in a certain business unit or in a certain country um, a problem with some categories, maybe with fraud or something. Yeah. So can you see trends um, uh, in your organization and can you use that data actually for, for the good and to improve um, also the fraud 
response management, but also the compli overall compliance management. Um, and um, <clears throat> what, what is also important here, of course, is that you have um, uh, yeah, can timely report as well as uh, to, the, to the right stakeholders um, so that they have the information they need to make their decisions. Um, and that you, of course, periodically uh, review your uh, whistleblowing framework, also your intake channels, do they work, do they not work, um, um, that you review them periodically and make sure that um, if you see some, some gaps or deficiencies that you can improve them uh, right away. And uh, yeah, the same applies then in that connection also to the question of how you um, how you uh, benefit from those conclusions in the case, yeah? Um, how can you feed them into your root cause analysis processes, um, lessons learned, and um, yeah, again, as I said before, use that data that you get, very valuable data that comes in there if you do it properly um, to, um, yeah, to learn from it and, uh, yeah, especially see trends and maybe bigger challenges in certain regions, business units, or whatever. Yeah, and with that said, I come to the last slide. What I wanted to show you very quickly is what from, from our perspective you need to think of when you are in the implementation phase, but also when it then goes uh, into daily business work. Um, I think uh, right now it's important to look uh, into your frameworks and see if there's any gaps left or if you really covered with all the requirements. Um, also look into your policies and procedures if there's anything that has to be updated. Um, also um, think about the question how you want to set it up, like do you want to follow the centralized approach um, or maybe a hybrid one with local involvement as well, or if you want to go completely local. Um, um, that you have the right uh, standards in place, how to deal with investigations that are coming out of that. Um, and then, of course, um, it's also important if you make all of those changes and also if you consider to um, use a um, um, tool that helps you for the web intake and also for the case management, you need to make sure that you um, get the, yeah, the, um, approvals and that you inform your works council if you have one and that this is all aligned and also with the data privacy uh, offices that you have. This usually takes a bit of time, um, but this is something you need to think of in the preparation phase as well. And when it then comes to the configuration and launch, of course, you need to make a launch plan. Um, we're just currently doing that with a big uh, with a big client um, and uh, the bigger you are, the more complicated it gets because you have different stakeholders, different groups um, that need to be trained on a different level and um, a lot of internal sites that need to be updated. So it's important to think about um, how you want to do it, when you want to do what, um, when you have to inform the people. Um, and also, yeah, think about the trainings that need to be conducted for the ones that should be in the reporting office answering those um, reports and following up, but also for the ones that actually should make reports. Yeah, and then, of course, uh, I said it before, I think um, this is when it comes to operation, um, it's very important that you document everything that comes in without a delay. Uh, that you ensure the confidentiality, um, that you uh, conduct thorough investigations that are impartial. Um, you also should not take so long. You should try to um, yeah, close the cases as fast as you can. Yeah, we have, if, you, if it takes quite long, then of course um, you need to report back to the whistleblower after those three months or within those three months, sorry, um, and then, of course, there might be uh, additional questions from the whistleblower side, um, uh, but also it increases the risks that he might think, okay, there's nothing happening or not enough happening. I might go to the external uh, reporting um, uh, channel and um, yeah, report the case there. Um, right, and then of course ongoing uh, tasks, um, I'm not going through all of them, but yeah, I think it's clear 
that you need to think about the regular reporting, how it should look like that you monitor the cases, especially times and dead, uh, timelines and deadlines, etc., and that you capture all of the information in a way that you can actually also um, analyze them at the end. You need to think about what you want to capture, um, what is helpful for you, and also on the other side doesn't um, um, overwhelm the whistleblower, of course, um, uh, but that's something very important to track this correctly and make sure that everything is going smoothly. Yeah, and um, in order to do that, I think um, a tool is helpful, also a case management. If you have automated workflows with notifications, etc., then this also makes your life easier and helps you um, to stay on top of all of your cases and make sure that everything is running smoothly. And with that, I give back to Jens. <clears throat> Antje, thank you so much. Um, really interesting insights and uh, from uh, just uh, following uh, the chat and the questions that came in, uh, I can say uh, everybody was obviously listening uh, really carefully, uh, but still there were um, a few questions coming up that we'll um, address in the Q&A afterwards and uh, no surprise, um, many of them related to um, central and decentralized systems that the let's say, all-time favorite in terms of questions about the whistleblowing directive. So uh, we'll um, save uh, some of them for the Q&A session. Um, before I uh, provide a, a really short uh, overview on um, technical solutions for the uh, internal reporting channel, let me just um, um, address uh, uh, a few short points. So one question that came in very interesting um, was that uh, someone was asking, um, she heard there's a second part of the Hinweisgeber-Schutzgesetz coming later. What is this about? Um, Antje, happy if you uh, uh, yeah. add to it, but um, I think the short version is it's about some public employees working for federal states in Germany in short words, right? Yeah, right. So um, in order to be able to find a compromise, they needed to take that part out um, it's more a, a question on when you are public official and working there, what you can report and what you cannot report. And they couldn't compromise on that. Um, they wanted to have it in. Um, one part of the government wanted to have it in, but um, one part of the federal council from the parties didn't want to have it in. So they decided in order to be, finally have a law at all, that they take this question out and put it back um, into the government uh, uh, government parliament later on. Thank you very much. So this is uh, um, answered. This is, let's say, kind of a very specific aspect um, then related to that. And um, then I also wanted to uh, maybe pick up again the, uh, the topic of uh, anonymity, because um, this is really quite interesting. It was. Um, uh, strongly discussed uh, throughout all the process. Um, the, um, as you said, uh, Antje, it uh, came into the German uh, draft and it was uh, uh, taken out again, or at, at least we have a softer um, uh, version of it now in the final uh, final law. But I think it's important to really state that um, um, the, the German legislation is now saying that the internal channel does not mandatory be um, designed um, to receive anonymous reports. But in, uh, on the other hand, um, it also means that this is not forbidden to do. And uh, what, yeah. what we can provide um, uh, here in terms of really best practice and experience, we strongly recommend that you include um, the option of anonymous reporting into your reporting channels for good reasons. On the one hand, it's, uh, it's really best practice and uh, there's a lot of studies, a lot of uh, empiric data available as well that shows that probably half of the reports that you could receive, you would not receive if you do not offer this option. Yeah? Because there are whistleblowers that fear retaliation and that would only report if they have the op um, possibility to report uh, anonymously. So you're interested to do that. And there's also a relation to uh, the external reporting channels that uh, Antje uh, mentioned so the German cartel office and the BaFin, the Financial Market Authority, they already offer these um, official external reporting channels, and they clearly offer um, an option for anonymous reporting as well. So if you have uh, people that would want to report anonymous, 
they can't do it uh, um, in the channel that you provide as the internal channel, they might even easier turn to an external channel and report there. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a clear recommendation, a strong recommendation from our side, all the best practice uh, and all the experience from more than 20 years um, really shows that this is the right way to go. All right, so um, talking about um, a channel, <clears throat> um, just uh, quickly, so um, EQS Group, uh, most of you, at least many of you, will know us. Um, we're doing this business um, with both brands, EQS, as well as uh, Business Keeper uh, since more than 20 years now. And um, uh, we can clearly say uh, we're offering the most trusted uh, whistleblowing solutions uh, in uh, in Europe and worldwide. Um, so we are approaching around about 3,000 customers um, already. So that's a large number of um, organizations and companies that uh, trust in us um, providing uh, good solutions. Um, we are basically a provider of um, a digital whistleblowing system. So a web-based uh, solution. Um, and why is this important and why are we um, uh, pointing out that this um, uh, is really uh, the, um, the solution of choice that you should be going to, uh, for? Uh, because on the one hand, um, it allows you to cover um, the uh, requirement that written reports um, must be possible. On the other hand, you can include um, phone-based, so already submitted reports into the same system as well and handle everything in one place. And clearly, um, it's, it's important to say that um, um, one of the fundamental requirements of the directive, as well as uh, the German legislation and uh, all the other member states' legislations that we currently have, um, do um, require from you that you make sure that access to the reports that come into the internal reporting channel um, are only accessible by people that are part of the team, right? So the announced team that um, um, is supposed to handle these reports in your organization um, must have access, but everybody else must not have any access to it. And this includes, and this is for example, excludes email um, as a solution because email means um, in the end, your internal IT department will be able to access, right? And they are not allowed to. So these highly secure web-based systems that are uh, also very lean, easy to implement, are clearly um, um, the solution of choice. And um, um, what we provide um, with it is uh, things like um, data privacy, GDPR compliance. So this is something that uh, is part of our DNA since the very beginnings, as well as uh, IT security um, 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 aspects. And uh, for sure, and this is uh, more a commodity, um, all the features, all the tools you would need within such a channel um, to handle uh, the cases, um, this is all um, available. Right. So it's uh, straightforward, easy to implement. It's um, as uh, stated uh, on this slide here as well, it's time and money saving. And um, our um, experienced team is really happy to take you by the hand and um, as Antje also mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, ombudsperson or uh, anyhow external um, experts, um, these could even be included in these technical solutions as case managers if you would uh, want to do this. So it's um, highly flexible um, as well. So with this, I would actually think let's uh, take the remaining 11, 12, 13 minutes um, for, uh, for the Q&A. I think it's uh, uh, important to really um, um, have, some, uh, have some time um, for this. So <clears throat> looking at the questions that uh, came in, let's start maybe with this one, um, Antje. Um, uh, the question that was asked is um, that uh, someone wants to do um, uh, clear and easy to understand. So also for people who are not lawyers, communication about uh, the whistleblowing legislation. And um, the main question is, um, how do we explain in simple words that everybody understands when are you pro uh, protected as a whistleblower by the directive and the legislation and when are you mm -hmm. not protected? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, yeah, I was also when I read the law, what a force or under the EU 
uh, law that is in scope of the uh, uh, the German law as well. Um, so of course you get like you think like, okay, how should I explain this to a normal person? Yeah. Um, so what helps I think is a lot when you make examples in your communication. If you provide examples for that. Um, uh, maybe small cases or what could be a potential breach of one of the EU laws, uh, but also examples help, of course, when it comes to the extended scope, like uh, what falls under that and what could be an example of a case that falls basically under this extended scope. So examples is the one I think that um, is in the communica communication with your personal, with your staff uh, important. Thank you very much for this. Um, let me uh, maybe add um, um, to this. So for me, and uh, I'm not a lawyer at all, um, for me, uh, one of the things uh, to, uh, to really easily understand uh, what I'm, uh, when, when would I be protected is uh, the uh, good face um, topic, right? So as long yeah. as I report in good face and based on what my organization is providing terms, uh, these are, let's say, the topics and scope you might report on. And we all know that it's not easy to differentiate between things like corruption, fraud, and other um, other topics uh, in all cases. Yeah, as long as I do it in good faith, um, I'm uh, on the right side. And um, besides that, I think uh, quite a lot of things will become clearer over time. Uh, there will be um, uh, cases, uh, court cases, and we'll see how this all develops. Um, but um, as the EU directive and also uh, all the member state legislations are about protecting the whistleblower, it's, it's maybe important to repeat this. This is not a whistleblowing law. It's a whistleblower protection law. Yeah, it's about the protection of the whistleblower, which means that um, the assumption is rather broad in terms of how do I lower the threshold, how do I um, encourage people to report without a fear of retaliation. So it's rather, rather um, kept wide in terms of the judgment when it's maybe a misuse um, of a reporting channel. Right. Um, so yeah, good. Good phrase is in Germany. You would also say um, "gesunder Menschenverstand." Yeah, it's uh, it's very similar. It's, uh, when you trust yeah. this, you should be on a quite good side. Um, all right. Let's take another question um, that uh, fits well to this. So, um, what about uh, whistleblowers and uh, their protection if they only use an external reporting channel? Are they protected if they do not first try out the internal one, but directly go to the external one? Yes, of course. So they can choose basically what they want to do, whether they want to report internally or whether they go to the external authority. Uh, same um, protection standards there apply as well. So that's why it's really, really, really important. Um, that you implement a whistleblowing framework that everyone trusts and um, that everyone uh, feels protected there and is sure that if they report something internally, it will be followed up, they won't get retaliated. Um, and so they don't even think about um, uh, going that other route, that other way, because again, as said, um, once the case is out and with an external authority, your options of managing the case, you know, might become quite limited. And that's, of course, something you don't want. What whistleblowers should not do is publicly disclose the case directly. So they first need to either report internally or go to the external authority, and then nothing happens. Um, so if the external authority doesn't respond to anything or the, the um, whistleblower um, uh, yeah, it doesn't get um, feedback within the time frame, um, or it's again there is a danger for for life and health. Um, then they can publicly disclose the case as well. But and th then the protection applies. That's the main point, even in that cases. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, thank you very much um, um, for this. Uh, again, um, adding um, there is uh, anyhow an obligation uh, for all of you to inform potential whistleblowers about uh, all available um, reporting channels. This includes the external reporting channels. So you will make them or will have to make them uh, visible and known as well. You might recommend uh, and, and say that you prefer that everybody uses the internal channel, but you cannot make it mandatory, right? And so it's uh, it's all about the choice of the whistleblower to say, where do I feel more comfortable, more secure with reporting internally, externally, whatever. Right? Um, um, another question uh, that uh, also fits uh, quite nicely to this, uh, because we said uh, low threshold should encourage people to report. Um, would it be sufficient um, in the German subsidiary to provide the channel just in English language? and not a German language, if English is an official company language. Yeah, so I think you should provide it also in a German language, um, because, um, again, the, um, the um, law requires that those that uh, should make reports or, or should be enabled to make reports, that they understand everything. And um, even if the company uh, yeah, language is English, it doesn't mean that everyone in your organization is able to speak English to a point where they feel, would be feel comfortable to make a report. So um, it should be in German, or you should provide also the possibility to report in German. Um, and um, this is also backed up by a lot of studies that whistleblowers uh, prefer, of course, to make reports in their mother tongue, um, that they feel much more comfortable um, in, in that. Wonderful. Maybe one question that I saw that maybe fits a bit into that too. Um, so I saw one question asking whether a company that has uh, branches in Germany needs to comply with that law as well. And the answer is very easy. It's yes. So even if you have headquarters outside the European Union or in another European country, you still need to make sure that all of your legal entities that you have in, in Germany, that uh, yeah, they are set up in the way that the Whistleblower Protection Act is followed and that they have the chance to, to report there. Um, so you need to make sure that also your German branches um, uh, comply with the Hinweisgeber Schutzgesetz. Um, thanks for this um, as well. Um, let's uh, maybe take a look at a few questions around um, uh, groups. So companies, uh, company groups acting in um, in different um, states and this uh, question of uh, central or decentral uh, whistleblowing channels. Um, as I said before, it's kind of an all-time favorite uh, topic. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, it's, it's at least confusing um, <laughs> to a certain extent when you look at um, what we have on the table, right? So the directive, and this is the opinion of the uh, commission, um, uh, clearly states that uh, if a subsidiary is uh, 250 or bigger, uh, then they need to have their own system, their own channel, mm -hmm. full stop, right? And um, st um, still some of the member states uh, decided to go a slightly different way and um, um, the German legislation uh, has also done that and has uh, clearly said a centralized, a centralized system um, is okay and can be used. So there's obviously a conflict. Yeah? How this will end up um, is something that we will probably only know in a few years. Um, yeah. But um, it uh, does not make all your lives easier. I think what is uh, absolutely clear is responsibility, in any case, remains with the subsidiary in each and every of the member states. So the German subsidiary is, uh, uh, will remain responsible for organizing all this, right? And if they um, uh, decide to um, use a central channel that is provided by, for example, the Austrian or US-based um, headquarter, um, the responsibility remains with them and um, they might need to go for things like uh, maybe a clear SLA, a documentation of the processes. Yeah, responsibility remains. This is very important to understand. Um, but a few questions uh, to you, Antje. So, um, from a, from a German perspective, um, if um, I'm working uh, for a subsidiary in Germany of a company headquartered uh, in Austria or 
another uh, country and uh, they provide um, a central system that is handled there. Uh, would that be okay? Um, yeah, so that is a good question. So um, I think that from my understanding for now, that would be okay so far. Um, of course, then you need to think about questions like um, when you have a headquarter outside, you have a centralized system and German employees, basically, if you have some sort of conflicting requirements, yeah, for example, just making it up, um, Germany provides a higher protection standard than uh, Austria, for example, I mean, in Austria, the um, the scope, uh, the material scope is a bit different. So what applies now? That's things you need to think of. But from my understanding, if this is a centralized uh, whistleblowing framework in Austria, where the German uh, yeah, employee has access, that would be okay for now, at least. Okay, thanks um, for this. Um, then we had a question in this context, um, and uh, I hope it's okay for everyone. I would say that we go until five minutes past twelve, probably until four more minutes. Okay for you? That's yeah, okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so um, the question was: um, Can subsidiaries uh, larger than two hundred and fifty? Uh, sorry, smaller than two hundred fifty employees? Sorry, I didn't hear your question. I think my internet was somehow... Ah, okay. Yeah, I will... Uh, we'll... I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question was, if subsidiaries are uh, smaller than 250, so that would be the yeah. 50 to uh, 249, um, uh, under the German law, uh, can they um, centralize uh, their internal channel anyhow to a central system? They can too. That's my understanding that... In Germany, we don't have that distinction. We don't need to make the distinction, at least for now. Um, so all the group companies can have a centralized uh, reporting at group level, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. And uh, then there was a question. I think we touched this already. Um, so is there any uh, recommendation or obligation that employees should or even have to report locally? So within their subsidiary. Yeah, yeah so no, um, they should be able to decide whether they want to report locally or whether they feel more comfortable with, um, with doing that at the group level. Um, so um, I think that's up to the whistleblower what they want to do. So there shouldn't be any obligation that they have to report locally first. Mm -hmm. And I mean, oh. on a practical note, you cannot change this anyway. So if a whistleblower feels more comfortable to report to another entity, he will do that, right? So, and then you have the report there and need to deal with it. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks for this. Uh, maybe um, closing this uh, um, Q&A session with, um, with another remark on this. So I think this, um, uh, groups, uh, groups of companies um, aspect, this will uh, still be around for quite some time because um, uh, the regulations are um, a, little, a little diverse on this. Um, I think our recommendation uh, clearly is that it's uh, mainly important that you, um, that you take transparent decisions, right? So look at your setup, look at your organization, look at the uh, um, legislations in the member states, um, attach the idea of all this uh, directive that it's about the protection of the whistleblower, and then focus on doing what makes sense and document what you're doing. Yeah? So if you decide in a certain country for a certain subsidiary to um, go with a local channel in another country to say, um, it's uh, here we go for our central system that we provide, the central channel, and so on. Document it, write down why you took this decision, and this should bring you in a um, rather good um, position um, if someone would, um, um, would assess it and uh, come to you and uh, ask uh, questions um, about this. And uh, the second, um, second thing is that um, 
uh, I think it's quite clear that we'll see um, authorities uh, in the first instance uh, most likely looking for organizations, companies that have not acted at all um, related to the uh, legislation, right? So they will be looking for those who did not implement any channel, did not communicate properly and all this stuff before they will start to go after those who are doing this uh, whistleblowing channel business uh, since a few years that are set up well already and are now in the, in the mood of uh, really fine tuning yeah, um, uh, in detail. So in terms of a, of a risk perspective, um, you are probably, if you already deal with this uh, since quite some time, you're not um, that much as risk. Um, Antje, anything to add from your side before we close? Uh, no, I think, I think you covered it all very good. Um, and thanks again from my side for, for inviting me to that webcast. And also thank, thanks to the audience. I've seen a lot of questions in the chat um, I think we will be able to answer them afterwards, I think, right? Um, that's what we uh, discussed. Um, so, yeah, but uh, anyway, if you have questions, uh, if you want to have, have a chat or something about that topic, do not hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy, uh, happy to help there. Wonderful. So um, with this, uh, uh, thanks once again uh, to you, Antje. Really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thanks uh, very much uh, for supporting and providing such uh, great insights. Thanks to all in the audience um, for um, staying with us and being so interested in this topic. Um, hope to see you again in uh, one of the next uh, webcasts uh, that we're providing. Just uh, uh, stay up to date, uh, take a look at our website, what we're offering. And uh, then let me wish you all um, a great second half of this week, uh, hopefully sunny day like here in Berlin. And uh, see you soon.